Thank you. Well, uh, I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me here and also for you for turning up. Really interesting meeting trying to blend a whole range of different things together. So Michelle has given a really excellent introduction for what I want to talk about. So I hope by the end of this talk, you'll agree that we can go to the regime which we might call extreme nano-optics. And uh, I hope you'll see that that might be a reasonable thing to say. So I'm going to try and get to this area called molecular uh, optomechanics in the end. So there's a large number of people involved. I'm just going to pick out a few people, and then I'll pick out others as I go along. So uh, uh, Bart has been with me for a number of years, and he's carrying on with this. I'll show you some data from Femi Jambati. Uh, and then Rohit Chikaradi is also here today, uh, uh, and you'll be able to talk to him. He's giving a talk in the afternoon about a different, slightly uh, a topic. And this, this area is a really close collaboration, both with chemists, so Oren Sherman's group, uh, for a lot of the chemistry, and Ulrich Kaiser's group for the DNA origami I'll tell you about. And then the theory is really intimately connected, as you'll see, and so particularly Javier Aspuria's group in San Sebastian, uh, but also Ortwin Hess uh, in Imperial and Edina Roster in Kings. So, uh, yeah, so a very large number of people involved, and you'll, you'll, you'll get to see why, I think, um, hopefully through the talk. So I'm going to tell you first about the constructs that we use that are essentially cavities, a bit like Michelle was talking about, that can confine the light to even tighter than you've seen already. And that opens up some interesting new regimes. I'll show you a little of that in the strong coupling regime for molecules. I'll show you single molecules. And then I'll try and show you uh, not luminescence so much as the vibrational uh, effects in this system. So that's what I hope to cover, and I hope I'll convince you in the end that one of the things that we can do is we can confine light to smaller than the size of a single atom. And by doing that, we can actually look at individual bonds, and we can track them in real time. So that's what I hope to convince you of. So um, we started this out trying to think of how do we confine light as tightly as possible because we want to look at, say, single bonds. And so the constructs that we were originally looking at for some time were, you know, how do we make diamonds like this? But as Michelle says, it's very hard to control these, very hard to control the gaps. So if you think about what's the thinnest material you could put in the gap there, that would be graphene. But unfortunately, those sort of constructs don't like to form reliably. What's really nice, though, is that we can use these ideas of image charges to replace one of the nanoparticles with a flat gold mirror. And then the nanoparticle on top essentially sees an image nanoparticle in the mirror. So any charge or any dipole inside here actually has image charges, and the system looks exactly like a dimer. And that's indeed correct, it turns out. Theoretically, the only difference is that it's not actually, as I've drawn it here, the gap is actually a little bit smaller than the real physical gap. Uh, and so the coupling is a bit stronger because you've got more metal there. So what we could do in this system here is we could actually look down to even looking at individual layers of graphene in the gap. And this is nice because it's a relatively simple system to make. You take a metallic, a flat metal substrate, gold, silver, copper, aluminium. Uh, you put a very thin layer, whatever it wants to be. Here it's graphene, but you can use molecular layers, as I'll show you. And then you just put gold nanoparticles on top, and the light is very, very tightly trapped in a series of modes in the gap there. And if you look in scattering in dark field, what you see are the different colors of the light that's trapped there. So for instance, if I look at a part of the sample here, I've got five layers of graphene, about a nanometer and a half, then I'll see this extra mode here in the infrared. So this is the normal plasmon of a single gold nanoparticle. I still see it in unpolarized light because I can see this trans transverse mode, but I have this coupled mode which is very tightly trapped in the gap. And indeed, as I make the gap thinner, I go to a single layer, it shifts to the red. So just as I'd expect in theory. And as I said, you don't have to do this in inorganic layers. You can do this in organic systems. So we've used this scaffolding molecule for a number of years called a cucubitrol that Oren Sherman's group in Cambridge have, have uh, explored in a lot of detail. And the only thing that's really important to it for it in this context is that it assembles in a particular way. It's a barrel. It's 0.9 nanometers high, and it binds gold very strongly, about half of the strength of a thiol bond. 
So what we can do is we can assemble such structures very easily. Here is the dark field measurements, same sort of measurements as this, just the scattering of individual constructs. They look like that in a dark field microscope. And it's this red mode here, this ring that you're seeing here very strongly. And each one of these is basically exactly the same. So you're defining that gap to what we think is about plus or minus 0.05 nanometers. Uh, now, what you can also do very nicely, as I'll show you a bit later, is that you can actually put molecules inside this barrel, which are then assembled in the middle of the gap there. So that's what we'll use for some of the experiments. Now, this system is actually very special. Uh, and I'll try and show you just one slide of the basic uh, theory that underpins why it's special. Essentially, it's based on the fact that although we've drawn this as a spherical nanoparticle, no nanoparticles are actually spherical. They're always faceted. And this bottom facet here essentially makes a very, very small waveguide. So this waveguide has got a dielectric spacer of a nanometer or so. And you can calculate actually analytically what the mode that will travel through that looks like. It's got a very, very large in-plane momentum, which equivalently means its wavelength, its, its effective wavelength, is very small, down to 100 times smaller than the free space wavelength. So on the order of 5 to 10 nanometers. So uh, what you find then is that when you look at such structures, well, in the real structure, you have boundaries at either end coming from the facet. So what this looks like, and this is basically will actually partially reflect the plasmons that exist in that gap there. They bounce backwards and forwards, and they form a fabry perot mode. But this fabry perot cavity here is 10 nanometers long or 20 nanometers long. It just depends on the facet size, which actually depends on the nanoparticle size. And in fact, you can write down an analytical formula for what actually is the wavelengths there, and it matches what you see in a perfect, a full calculation and what we see in experiments. So there's a series of modes. This is the lowest order mode that actually sit in that gap there. I have to be patient here. And I'm a very impatient person. Um, so, and that, that light is trapped in a very, very small volume. You can actually analytically calculate it. And the optical field strength in there is on the order of 500 to 1,000 times the optical field that you're putting in. That's the field. So the intensity is a million times larger. And therefore, signals which go nonlinearly are very, very strongly enhanced in here. And it's also laterally confined to on the order of 5 nanometers or so. So the problem with this mode here is that it has this very, very, well, it has a, a, very, a very large K, which means that it couples very, very poorly to free space. In fact, these modes probably exist on all surfaces that we ever make out of metals. We just never see them because you can't get light in and out of them. And the other thing that's very nice about this system is that we have a mode which is actually across the whole system here. It's what we call an antenna mode. So it's essentially like a plus charge at the top and minus at the bottom. And there is a symmetry of some of these modes here that couple very strongly to this antenna mode. And what it means is that we can get light very efficiently in and out of that structure with efficiencies of the order of about 50% or so. So now we can actually couple to this um, uh, system. So, in fact, uh, if you want to see more about this, there's a review that's just come out this last week in Nature Materials where you can see all of this. So, to summarize why it's special, it's, now, there's many groups now working on it. We've done a lot of work in this area. So, you have very, very small mode volumes on the order of tens of nanometers cube. So, still many molecule size, but, but, but small. They're very robust. They're all the same, say, compared to dimers or other sort of structures. You have very, very high field strengths. So anything that you put in the gap, you're going to couple to very strongly. So that's why it's of interest in this forum here. One of the things that's maybe particularly important is, and it was referred to in the last question of the last talk, when you take a, an emitting molecule, say, and you bring it close to a metal surface like gold, you get quenching. So if I look at the emission efficiency, as I bring that molecule closer, within about five nanometers, I get quenching as all the energy is transferred into the thermal vibrations of the metal. But that's not true in this construct, because what happens is there's a competition between the absorption into the metal and the re-radiation. And it's very, very efficient at getting light out of the structure. So what you see in these structures here for different nanoparticles is this enhancement factor carries on going up as you bring the, the chromophore closer and closer to the surface. So that's what makes everything here possible. 
So one of the things that, that Rohit actually did a few years ago is we started looking at can we get into the strong coupling regime of single emitters at room temperature. So in the strong coupling regime, essentially we take uh, an emitting molecule or an emitter, and so it's got a two-level system, which is resonant in some sort of cavity. Here it's our plasmon cavity, with a coupling which is this Rabi frequency omega. And there's some loss rate from the cavity and some dephasing rate of the, of the system. So if it's at room temperature, we can't really change that dephasing rate. It's essentially given by this thermal bath that everything is embedded in. It's very hard to decouple from that. So this is on the order of 25 milli electron volts or so. And then what's important in the system is this, Q, this Purcell factor. So how good the resonance is, essentially, this quality factor, which is set by the loss here, and the volume of the mode. And if you compare a lot of different ways of confining light, you find that the largest Purcell factors are given by this sort of system that I'm showing you here. So if indeed we're going to have a, a, a room temperature system, this is large, so the Q factor actually is better if it's small. So then we need volumes less than 10 to the minus 5 of the wavelength of light embedded in that material. So only really plasmonics can do that, and this system is really the best for doing that. So the only other thing that's important to think about here is that the optical field of the lowest mode here, which is the, the favorable one, is actually across the gap. Which means that if you want to couple to this dipole here, you have to make sure that your dipole is also vertical. And most dipoles like to lie flat in a thin gap. So for that reason there, we use the same cage system I've shown you already, this CB molecule here, and we took the same molecule that Vishal was showing, methylene blue, which actually fits, it actually assembles with very, very high specificity and affinity inside that CB cage. So the CB cage is non-resonant, but the methylene blue molecule inside it is resonant. So we can assemble this structure, we can tune the plasmon mode around by changing the nanoparticle size or the gap, and essentially we're taking the plasmon mode and making it resonant with our electronic state, and we're making this coupling large because this volume is now very small. And when we do that, we can get to the system where these are now so tightly coupled, you get new states which are split above and below in energy, and each of these states is half a plasmon, half a molecular excitation. So we might call it a plexiton. So you see that in the experiments in the dark field, you just see this splitting here when you've got the system on resonance. So you can get very large splittings here. And the interesting thing about this system is that uh, it allows you to make a system which is non-linear at the single photon level. As soon as I put a photon in here, it changes the system. And there's a lot of interest also in the fact that I've actually changed the energy levels of this molecule. So its chemistry should so not start to now be different. So that's another of the things that we're ex exploring at the moment. So this is a very nice system, but one of the problems with it is that we don't actually have a precision about where exactly this active molecule sits in the cavity. So that's why we went to this next system here. So again, Rohit was involved in this work as well, but also Ulrich Kaiser's group. And what we do is we use DNA origami as a scaffold. So people will talk later, Tim Liedl, I think in the next session, will talk about DNA origami. Essentially, it's knitting with a very long molecule that's very well described. I take a, a piece of viral DNA, which is all the same, and I add maybe 100 staple strands that bind different bits of it together. And it's a very beautiful technique. And here we're using it to make a very very precise tile. It's, a, uh, it's a, a rectangular tile, and what it does is it, it binds to gold on the bottom. It's got some extra strands that bind down onto gold. It's got some special strands, six of them pointing up, which binds to a molecule, which is, uh, uh, sorry, it binds to a gold nanoparticle, which has got some uh, complementary oligomers, oligomers on it. So then I bind this gold nanoparticle directly on top of it, and then inside it, what actually I've done is we've put a single emitting molecule, and we can put it at any position that we want. So here we've got this emitting molecule, but now we can prescribe its position. And in these first experiments, we're using CY5, but we've used a whole range of different molecules. So essentially what we can do is we can move that molecule around. When we look at its emission spectrum, so this is just the emission spectrum here of CY5, we'll see that this one has got single molecule in it because it lasts for a certain time, and then it bleaches. Uh, at the same time, if I look at the scattering spectra, I can see this sort of near strong coupling regime. It's not quite as uh, good strong coupling because the DNA origami is slightly thicker. So we've got a thicker gap and a larger mode volume. And when it collapses, we indeed see this goes back to just the plasmon resonance. 
So now what we can do is we can look at the, the strength of that emission there as a function of placing this molecule in different uh, positions near the gap. And this is the result of each one of these points is maybe a thousand of these nanoparticles or mirror, and we're just moving that molecule in a different construct in a slightly different place by slightly changing its linker position. And what you can see is that we trace out here, we trace out a luminescence enhancement, which actually traces out the optical mode in the gap there. And we can see that here, it almost exactly matches theory, that it's about a mode of seven nanometers or so in width. So we see this very strong enhancement in emission. We also actually see that the, the degradation takes longer because it's probably confined, and also it gets rid of its energy quicker. So the faster it gets rid of its optical energy, the less chance there is for a, 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 a switching over to some of the, the other branches. So then what we want to do is, is actually start to see, can we do some sort of quantum electrodynamics with this system? So this is work that Femi Arjabati has just been doing, and we, we're sort of carrying on with some of that. We take uh, this sort of molecule, uh, and what we do is, in the DNA origami here, what we now try and do is we pump it with picosecond pulses. So we actually want to see, is it emitting single photons, because it's a single molecule, now resonantly embedded in this structure? So what we do is we, we're going to pump it somewhere around in this region here, and we're going to look at the emission, and we're going to design the plasmon cavity to be in resonance with the emission here. And this shows you one of the differences to the sort of classical ideas about strong coupling. So here what I've shown is that the strong coupling is actually only on the emission. You can't simultaneously in this system make it strong coupling on the absorption and the emission because they're in different spectral positions. So here, we're exciting up to this state, there's some sort of molecular relaxation, and we've split these levels up here. So we do the experiment. The first thing we see is that if you look at this uh, dye molecule emission in solution, it's a couple of nanoseconds, and here it's way too fast for us to measure. So from the strong coupling, we know that the lifetime of the emission should be less than 100 femtoseconds. So we're never going to be able to resolve that by using standard time correlated single photon counting. But what we can do is we can look at the, the correlations between photons coming out. So what you expect to see is if it's only emitting one photon at a time, then if I'm detecting in the normal uh, uh, sort of experiments, I'll only be able to, to see one photon coming out, not two. And the signature for that is basically a zero of the emission when I'm looking at correlate more than one photon coming out from the structure at the same time. So indeed, I actually see that I can get that effect, but it depends on where I'm pumping the system. If I pump the system at a slightly different spectral position, I can actually find it's more likely to get two photons out. So what it shows is that we don't really understand theoretically this system yet. We have to understand how strong coupling works when we're in a system where we have a molecular system, we have reorientations between uh, absorption and emission, this Stokes shift. So that's one thing that we're carrying on. The other thing that's very nice about this platform is we can change the number of emitters that we put on it. So, for instance, as we increase the number of chromophores, that Rabi coupling just increases the square root of the number. But we can also use different molecules which resonantly couple together and make all sorts of interesting coherent electronic states. So that's one direction that we're trying to go in. Uh, another one is just actually to ask the question, can we actually do, can we make even smaller gaps and put more robust molecules in there? So this is some work that's just coming out from uh, uh, Charlie Redman. Uh, and a few years ago, we showed that the, the volume of the mode is sort of limited by this size here. So it's limited by this quantum tunneling length. As soon as I get my two metals close enough together, electrons can quantum mechanically tunnel from one side to the other in the time period of a single plasmon. And what that does is it shorts out this plasmonic effect here. I can't build up charge on these two interfaces because it gets shorted out. So that's around 0.4 nanometers, and it's very hard to change it. So the question is, can we build a molecular system that actually is of that size? And we've used this bisphalocyanine system here. So essentially, it's a, it's a, 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 it's a, a, a dimer system which is glued together by a single lanthanide ion in the middle. And the nice thing about this system is we can change the lanthanide ion. So we've done a whole series for the moment, but there are actually a large number of other uh, ions that you can put in there. And each one of them has slightly different electronic states or magnetic states. So we can start to look at the effects of tunneling through those. And the gap sizes look to be about 0.4 nanometers, both that's the expectation, and also set by the resonance that we see experimentally, which is now shifted beyond 800 nanometers.
So if we look, for instance, at the position of this mode here, as we change the size of this ion, which slightly changes the size of this molecule and therefore the gap, we find that we get very, very strong tuning. And that tuning can't be explained by any sort of quantum tunneling and also classically. So at the moment, again, we have a system which is sort of at the boundary of sort of classical quantum. We don't have theories which can both explain the electronics of this molecule, so in other words, time-dependent DFT, at the same time as you're doing the classical continuum calculations for the electromagnetism. So it's really pushing the theorists to develop harder. We're working quite hard on this area as well. So how do we actually try and explain both classical and quantum together in this system? So this is also interesting for a, a whole variety of new constructs as well. So what I wanted to do in the, in the last part of the talk was talk about uh, what happens when we start to look at vibrations in the system. And this is the first time we've really uh, scaled down an experiment by 10 to the 13 orders, of, uh, 10 to the 13 in scale. Because the theory that underpins this all came from gravitational wave detection. So that's an interferometer, and you have basically these two very long arms, and there's a huge mirror which is reflecting each of these beams at the end, and that mirror is actually held on glass fibers. And it, it's like a pendulum. It can vibrate backwards and forwards. And what people realized already in the 60s was that the pressure of the light, the lasers that's in those interferometer arms, pushes on that mirror. And you have a coupling between those two things, the light pressure and the vibrational resonances here. So there's some interesting effects that you get from that coupling. And people have now, since then, started to look at small versions, which essentially these scale down to the micron scale. So you have micro, micro cavities which can actually vibrate like this. So essentially what's going on is that, just what I said, there's a coupling between the intensity of the light, that's this term here, and the movement of this mirror here. That's this term here. And this coupling constant is often known as the optomechanical coupling, G. And that G depends on the volume of the optical mode in here. So it's, this energy here is unbelievably small for the gravitational wave detector. But even for these systems, the microfabricated systems, it's on the nano-electron volt scale. And that's why people doing optomechanics need to cool down their samples to millikelvin or so to try and get to this temperature scale. Now, it turns out that the system we're looking at here, essentially a cavity with molecules in it, which have got springs, they're bonds, actually has the same Hamiltonian. It's the Hamiltonian for Raman scattering. But these two communities hadn't brought it together, and there's some new terms which appear when you actually look at the coupling from this perspective. So now we can look at what happens in, in, in a... This is a molecular uh, energy level, and these are the vibrations that exist for this one particular bond in this molecule here. So if I, normally when I'm doing Raman scattering, I'm exciting the system non-resonantly, and most of the time it just scatters back out, but there's some inelastic scattering when there's some probability for the photon to drop back in, uh, into this, or the electron, sorry, into this higher excited vibrational state here, and then it gives me a photon which is redshifted. So if I look at a typical uh, molecular system here, I excite it, and I see something coming out to longer wavelength here. And those are, each of one of those is a different vibrational bond. And of course, I can do the thing in reverse. I can actually take anything that's in this first vibrational state, take it back out, and get a, a photon which is now on the blue side here. So essentially, the ratio of emission on the blue side of the laser to the red side of the laser, a bit as Michel was already talking about, it tells me the temperature of the system. It tells me the occupation of this first vibrational state. So typically, people have used the ratios here to come back and get a temperature. So what we did now is we took this system, the nanoparticle and mirror system, now with a whole set of different molecules, and they're perhaps... Um, 50 molecules to 100 molecules sitting in the gap here. And we're probing them all at the same time. And uh, we've cooled the sample down to 10 Kelvin, so there's no emission on the anti-Stokes side. And we can just see the, this is uh, uh, a set of essentially rings on the uh, Stokes side that we can see. So this is a benzene thiol, um, uh, a, a, diphy, a diphenyl a molecule. So what happens is we look at this, but then sometimes something else happens we start to see these strong bursts of emission on the anti-Stokes side, which is exactly mirrored by new lines appearing on the Stokes side. And if you would just measure a temperature from these, you'd find they're several thousand degrees. And each line is a different temperature. So that's very peculiar. And uh, what you also see is that these lines move around. 
So we still keep these lines here, which are from 100 molecules, but these lines come from some individual object, where its energy is changing, some vibrational state that's changing. So what we think is going on, and I'll show you some more evidence for that uh, in the next few slides, is that the light is pulling out from the gold facet a single gold atom. And it's remaining in contact. Uh, and what you find if you do uh, the calculations, both classical and quantum, is that there's actually an extra degree of field confinement, which is down to the single atom level. It's about five-fold extra optical field here. But if I think about the SIRS, that gives me several hundredfold enhancement in the SIRS. And then the molecule which sits underneath here is going to have a Raman scattering cross-section, which is much, much larger, so I can now see it in here. So what actually happens is I start to drive the vibrational excitation of this single molecule that sits under this, which we call a peaker cavity, because the volume of this is less than a nanometer cubed. So I'll show you in a second what we can do from the experiments is we can actually measure this G now by looking at these ratios and the power dependence of them. And from the G, we can very directly get the volume. So we can show the volume here is less than a nanometer cubed. We also break all the selection rules as well. So typically, we have experiments that will do this. As soon as we see extra emission on the anti-stoke side, we'll immediately get the experiment automatically at high speed to do a power dependence on that single molecule with a single gold atom, which is pulled down near it. And from the power dependence here, we can see that the emission here is linearly dependent on power now, which is not what you expect for a thermalized system. And from the gradient, we can actually pull out the G. And then from all these parameters in here, the only thing we want to measure here is the volume. So we can do this many, many times on many, many different peak cavities. We can form it essentially on demand. And in all cases, we get volumes less than a nanometer cubed. So there are many puzzles about this. The, f the first thing is, how is it possible I can even think about a classical confinement of light on this level? Why don't I need to think about the quantum mechanics of that single gold atom? And the answer seems to be from comparing the theories is that as long as this gold atom is in contact, so electrons from the bulk can go in and out, actually classical electromagnetics works on the single atom level, sort of amazingly. So it's basically just like a dipole sitting in there. Um, now, the next thing that we don't really understand is how does light pull this gold atom out? It will also push it back in again. And we show from a whole range of experiments that the thermal activation, or the, the, sorry, the, the energy activation of this is what we expect for an ad atom on gold. It's about 0.8 EV. It's about what it should be for silver as well. So, and, and definitely if I, lose, if I dr drop the light power as soon as I formed one, it will stay there. So I can put in very weak light. 100 microwatts, I pull down my gold atom, and then I can just reduce the light. I can still see my molecule, but I leave that gold atom there, and I can slowly increase the light intensity, and eventually it pops back into the gold. We're trying now to be able to move it around laterally, uh, but we don't know what the forces are. It could be um, uh, tweezing, so actually optical forces on the, on the atomic scale, because if you look at the field gradients here, they're absolutely enormous but it's not clear how to do the theory for that properly, and there are really a large number of other mechanisms that are possible as well. So for the moment, we just use that. So that was a peak cavity. Now I'm going to go back to the system I showed you that was actually where I have large number of molecules in there, but now I'm going to try this pulsed. So the problem we find with pulses is that the gold atoms move even more. And that's not particularly surprising, because now my field, my peak field is a thousand times larger. So all of those forces are enhanced a lot. So now when you do these experiments, the average powers have to be a microwatt or below. So this starts to get technically very difficult to do. What the theory of the optomechanics shows you is that actually, as you start to increase the laser power, so what happens is I start to populate the phonon uh, that I was showing you here as I increase the laser power. And at some point, however, everything takes off. There's a point here, essentially, where what it wants to do is to start the molecule vibrating. I'm pumping it with light, and it actually wants to vibrate. So we tried a whole set of experiments like that. So we send in picosecond pulses into this cavity here. Uh, and essentially, we can just uh, look at the population here by looking at the stokes now. When we, in CW, we see everything is linear. But when we go to the pulsed regime, when we go above a threshold, it starts to go non-linear. 
And the point at which it goes non-linear, again, relates to the G we talked about before. And it's essentially that we're starting to get to this first stage here, where the molecule is really starting to vibrate. Or if you like, what we're starting to do is to pump up this ladder here. So we're starting to pump a number of the higher vibrational states. What seems to happen, at least in this system, to start with, is that we always seem to break the molecule at that point. And it's maybe not surprising when I'm up this ladder here, it's easier to cross over into a bond-breaking excited state. So uh, now we're trying to see, can we control this? So this is, if you like, molecular, molecular it's, it's optomechanics. But to engineer this, this system here, I actually just change the molecule. So actually, I can now do all of my engineering just by doing different molecules. Uh, so just, actually, I'll just show you some raw data here, just to show you how, how, how you know, reasonable this effect here is. If I look at the background here as a function of power, and this background here is the, 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 the background that comes from electrons in the metal, so that's completely linear. And at the same time, we're taking, say, the integrated source from this peak here, and you can see it's nonlinear. So it's, it's, it's really clearly some sort of driven system here. So what I wanted to do is to, to show you something that we've been doing uh, more recently, carrying on with this idea of pica cavities. So I showed you originally that we can stabilize these pica cavities at low temperature. But we want to do ambient. We want to do chemistry. We want to, to really look at what's going on. So now what we've been able to do is to do all of this at room temperature in ambient conditions. And the way that we do that is we just have to take everything faster because the dynamics is faster. So now we go to essentially millisecond SIRS. And we've, on this data here, which we just published recently, uh, we have a couple of million spectra, which we've analyzed. And what you'll see is sometimes that you'll see these new lines appear. This is when a peak cavity is forming. You're pulling a gold atom down here. In this work here, we use a new molecule, which has got a C triple bond N at the top. That's a nice vibrational uh, resonance because it's out here in 2,000 to 2,200 wave numbers. What it means is that then you can actually see this in isolation from all the rest of the complications in the system. And what we can do is we can distinguish if the gold atom is pulled from the top here or from the bottom. Because if it's pulled from the bottom, we don't really see the effect on this bond. So we only see the effect on the rings. So we see that line there. But if it's pulled from the top, we see these lines here. And DFT tells us that what's happening is that we're actually forming a coordination bond between this gold atom here and the nitrogen, and we're stealing some electron density from this triple bond here. So we can essentially watch the, the electrons in a bond, this is one bond that we're watching here, as a function of time over tens of seconds at room temperature. Uh, we can see it move around. We're trying to understand why the electrons are moving around. The molecule is twisting. Uh, all sorts of things are going on. Essentially, what we think we can do is we can measure the position of the atoms to within five picometers, the bonds to within 0.1 degrees, and the electron density to at least 1% of the electron density of the bond. So we're starting to really understand what does this molecule do in this very strange environment. Um, I'm not going to show you more. Essentially, we're actually going from single molecule to wallpaper, which changes color. So we've actually developed a system here where we use uh, electrochromic polymers that sit in the same gap here, which we can oxidize and reduce by stably, and they change color. So essentially, once you've got this gap that's constrained by, say, the coating on the particle here, you can actually scale it up to a massive scale. And we're already starting to do large areas with that. Right, so we're doing cars, but people can come ask me afterwards. So what I want, hope I've shown you is that this construct, which we call the nanoparticle on mirror, is a very reliable way of confining light very, very tightly. So you can start to look at single molecules and look at their dynamics and looking at their chemistry in real time. And I've shown you a number of ways to do that. There's a whole variety of other things that we're playing with as well. You want to make active devices where you can get them to change. You can look at electrochemistry on surfaces using this sort of technique. You can look at the dynamics of single bonds, and we actually can make some practical applications with it as well. So thanks for listening. That's really amazing work. Blew me away. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, the first was about the molecular optomechanics. 
So I guess if you can see phonon lasing, then this allows you to boost the signal to noise in SIRS. Is that actually a useful thing for SIRS applications? Well, so, okay, that's a good question, and we're trying to do it. Uh, so essentially, the question is, can you get more light out by mixing in this non-animate regime? So that's, it's all fine as long as you don't break your molecule. And so we're really only just at the early stages of trying to work out why do molecules break? Do they always break in this circumstance? Uh, you know, how, even understanding what this gold atom is doing with respect to the molecule, I think, is, is where we're starting out. And we have to understand the forces on the atoms as well. Yeah, there are forces on the molecules. So there's a whole range of things. So I think the answer is we have to investigate it. Well, and, and the second question should be really quick. You mentioned that... Um, uh, that you need to have the dipole aligned vertically. The optical forces are going to want to make the dipole align vertically. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you can just use the very strong electric field from mm. your system to do the alignment for you. That's a really interesting idea. So the question is, is the cohesive force for, say, some sort of ring-like molecule wanting to lay it down? Can you pull it off? Um, we haven't seen any evidence of that yet, but there's so many things going on in our data. And, and it's an interesting idea. So I, I've actually thought of something else, is that if I have a self-assembled monolayer, which many of these experiments are done on, then the fact that I've got a lateral field confinement wants, means that the molecules want to bunch into the center as well. So there the, are the lots of questions. For instance, what do we mean by refractive index when we're looking at small numbers of molecules in a very, very tight field volume? So the concept of refractive index starts to become unclear. So which is why the theory becomes, I think, very uh, difficult to do as well. All of these things have to be disentangled and teased out, but at least I think we have a system where we can do that. Okay, Good thanks. question. Just an amazing talk. It's just a quick question. You mentioned in your talk that you've used polymers. What type of polymers have you used? Were it conducting or not conducting polymers? So for, for this work that I'm just um, mentioning down here, this is just, this is just coming out in a few months. So um, we've used polyaniline systems because they're a simple, well-understood electrochromic polymer. So there's a whole range of different systems that you can use as well. We've also tried a lot of electrochemistry on, on self-assembled monolayer systems as well. But the polymer is an interesting one because you can actually scale the whole thing up. So we've actually done large-scale batches and are doing this on roll-to-roll. -roll. So from single molecules to roll-to-roll, -roll, and it looks completely feasible. That the advantage is because you can find the light to such a small region here, to get a color change over a large you know, area, the optical cross-section is quite large, micron scale, that actually you only need to change the properties of a very small volume. That means your switching can be very low energy. So the reason that we don't have building scale, you know, electrically tunable color changing materials is the energy required for that in current paradigms is enormous. So if you can do something like this, which is bistable, you only need to switch like 20 nanometers cubed volume, then it's, it, it brings down all of those requirements hugely and that's why it looks plausible, as well as you can make something flexible and low cost. So. Interesting question. Um, I have a question with respect to your anti-bunching experiment. What is the hand-waving argument that you get, the bunching, that you have two yeah. photon emission? Yeah. Well, I can hand-wave hand all I want, but <laughs> rigorous is good. The, the, the idea, so people have seen this with quantum dots before, and what they say that you can happen is that you actually have a manifold of energy states. So you have like a bi-exciton states. So you can excite up this ladder, and then it emits two photons at once from this bi-exciton state. So if you like, the photon, the pulse that we put in is short, and the question is, can it, can it, does it only absorb one photon, can it actually absorb two photons to a state there? And again, in the molecular system, it's really not understood what we mean in that context. So that would be my possible discussion. Maybe it's that. Good question. Uh, one, more short, one more short question, if there is one. If, There's one here. Oh, yeah. no. There's one. Hi, thank you, amazing. Um, is there a way of looking at the atom that you pulled out later with um, some tunneling microscopy? Or okay, so we might ask the question, where is the atom that I'm pulling out? So it's most likely to be in the, the, the largest field region because we know it's optically, um, there's an optical force there of some sort. Um, so what we would have to do is we'd have to stabilize it, take the nanoparticle off, look underneath with SDM, I believe one could get any result one wanted from that. So I don't know that's the easier way to do it. 
Um, so certainly people have done with STM, they know that ad atoms move out, they move around. Um, I think maybe the easiest thing that we're doing at the moment is we're looking at those energies that I showed you. I showed you that the, the, the lines here actually, if I look here, so these lines here, you can see there are all sorts of jumps in there. There are large jumps, small jumps. We have millions of data on that. So what we can do is we can start to look at the energy landscape for that gold atom, and we can start to look at why it might go in different direction to what it's doing, and I think that will make sense. So spectroscopy, I think, is going to be better than a direct measurement of it in the end. I'll believe it more. Thank <music> you.